show it to you. chapter 8. Numbers chapter 8, and um, we know that Exodus, uh, Bible starts off, you know, I always thought about this, there's a few books that they don't end well. Most of the Bible, the last chapter ends well, but in some books it doesn't end well. One of the books is Genesis. Genesis ends up, we end, it ends up in a coffin in Egypt. And then Exodus comes in, it's like a, a redemption book, and, and God's going to provide a way. And then, uh, and that's what he did, you know, in Exodus. And then you get into Leviticus, he, he has a, he, he kind of does a cram session to the Levites, writes to them and says, hey, look, you're going to be serving the people, uh, I want you to do it this way, okay? And he puts it, puts it on them, and now their uh, numbers is like now, that that's done, now you're going to go through your time, okay? And uh, it's a book of 39, of over 39 years here, and uh, now it's the execution phase, okay, of, of, the, of more of a historical time, and then when we get into Deuteronomy, what's going to happen is it's going to be the second, they're going to be ready to get in, ready to go into land, and in Deuteronomy, and, and it's no different than you, it's, you've been waiting 40 years to do something, you get excited. It's time. Okay, uh, I'm getting, I'll, I'll tell you the truth, I'm getting everybody excited right now for the rapture. I think it's that close. I'm getting excited now. It's, we're going to see the Lord soon. Amen. We're going to see him soon. So, uh, he's going to look at, in chapter, uh, chapter 7, we saw the princes and they brought their, they all brought their, the same, uh, the same uh, offerings. They brought the same offerings. Why? Well, it's always the same when you bring your offerings. It's always the same. Yes, I understand some people, we're not talking about tithing. We're talking about your initial bringing in. Okay? And now what we're going to talk about today, we're going to deal with the Levites again, just like we dealt with them in Leviticus. We're going to deal with the Levites again, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a little different. So let's get in and look at this, and, and uh, I want you to see yourself. Why don't you see yourself in here? See yourself in Numbers chapter 8. Just like Numbers chapter 6. The Nazarites, did you see yourself in it? I don't drink anymore. I've given that up. I don't do these things. I abstain from these things. Well, that's voluntary. You're a Nazarite. You're a Nazarite. Because it can be a man or a woman. So it doesn't matter. Now let's look at uh, chapter 8, the... Uh, we're going to see some separation again, the, the separation of Levites. But he's going to put this first part, these first four verses in. Now let's look at these first four verses. He says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron, and say unto him, When thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. And Aaron did so. He lighted the lamps thereof over against the candlestick as the Lord commanded Moses. And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, was beaten work according unto the pattern which the Lord had showed Moses. So he made uh, the candlestick. And uh, we got these right in. We're talking about the candlestick right now. And uh, you'll notice something. Uh, Moses, he's, the Lord spake to Moses, and he says, you go speak 
to Aaron. Uh, the Lord uses men to speak. Uh, and you're going to find that that's how it's going to be done. God's going to, God's a spirit. And uh, those who worship him worship in spirit truth, but God's a spirit. You have to understand that. God is a spirit. Uh, I'll give you a verse that, that helps you today. Jesus Christ came on the earth, but we knew him not, right? And then he went away. The, you know, the Bible says we know him not after the flesh anymore. We know him not after the flesh anymore. What's that mean? You don't know what he looks like. You actually think you do. It's like people that walk around. Look, man has a weird imagination. you got people walking around today with uh, every year about Christmas time or any time about any other time, they got these winged things walking around saying they're angels. My question to you is, do angels have wings? It's not in the Bible. No, they don't. They look like man. When the angel shows up, nobody goes, what's those wings for? They said, we look, they look like men. So we have a what? Wrong perception. Why? We've been giving a wrong perception. I'll give you another one. Okay? Every time they show an angel, what sex is the angel when you see it? Yeah. It's a girl. Can you show me the girl angel in the Bible? I've only seen the female. Only a male. Yeah, it's yeah, only the male in the Bible. It's only a male in the Bible. Why? I'm just, you know, just, just an observation. Just an observation, okay? Just these things that you go, oh, well, okay. I have no problem you want to put wings on angels, make them look different than everybody else, but let's face it, they don't. They're just, just not there. But um, here we got, and he, and he says, you go speak, and guess what? I want you to speak unto Aaron. So he's going to deliver the message unto Aaron. The preacher preaches the message, okay? And what you'll notice is it says in verse number two, speak unto Aaron and say unto him, when thou lightest the lamps, the seven lamps shall give light over against the candlestick. Who lights the lamps? Aaron. Did he say anybody else? So at this moment, who lights the lamps? Aaron. Okay? That's important. Why? Because if you remember, there were, there were two boys that Aaron had. And they went into the tabernacle and they, they used strange fire. Remember? And they got done away with. Okay? They got done away with. Why? It wasn't done properly. It wasn't the right fire. Okay? You know, uh, just so you know how that fire works is when the glory of God comes down it, from, from heaven it came down into the tabernacle, okay, a light, the fire comes out from there. He's the one that lights it. So when they grow and go, they go to the place where God lit it, they get the fire from there and they put it on white. The illumination has to come from God. You understand what I'm saying? Illumination has to come from God, okay? When you read your Bible and you understand, how many times you've been reading it and all of a sudden you're like, I didn't, you didn't understand it before, but all of a sudden it comes to you. Hey, wait a second, I just, just woke up from something. It's like a dream, which just woke up from a dream, okay? And uh, that's, just so you know, that's the illumination on the book. That's what it's like, the illumination. It's no different than when you were unsaved. I hear it all the time, people on stage trying to read the Bible, and they go, oh yeah, I, I, I was here. I, I read through the Bible. You didn't. You wouldn't, you can't. You, because the natural man, the natural man can't receive the things. Okay? I hear it all the time, but I know the truth. Okay. And that is the, and how are they going to understand it? You're going to have to go to the author, and you don't know him. So, when you get saved, what happens? And all of a sudden, there's like this light goes on. And God will let you understand so much as you go along. Why? Because the more you get, the more you're going to be responsible for and you're not ready for everything. Yet it's no different than a kid. It's portions at a time. So, this uh, he gives it to Aaron. So Aaron is going to light. Now, Aaron is a picture of the high priest. He's the high priest. So he's a picture of who? Jesus. Jesus is your high priest in the Bible, right? So, if Aaron's lighting the candles, who's actually lighting the candles? Jesus. Jesus. He's the lighter of the candles, okay? And uh, he puts the light, and you've got to understand, it says now, look what it says at the end of verse number two. It says, shall give light over against the candlestick. Now, if the candlestick is, uh, we know when you walk in the uh, tabernacle, the candlestick is actually to the left. 
To the right is the showbread, the table of the showbread. What's that? That's the Word of God. So you've got to be pretty careful because this is the carefulness of it. That candlestick is the only thing lighting in that tabernacle. And what he wants it against is, it says against the candlestick, it's supposed to light and put light on that word. That's how you understand it better is because God puts light on that word. It's the light of God. That light came from God. Right. You have a few things in this world that come from heaven. Guess what? The only one you have now is that book you hold in your hand. That is the only thing outside the universe that you have of God. You don't have pictures. You don't have statues. You don't have all this stuff. We think we do. We want to be religious, but guess what? You don't have anything like that. You got one thing, and that's that book. And the words that are on that book are, are spirit words. So Jesus puts the uh, light on the word. He puts the light on the candlestick, and uh, and without that, without the candlestick, uh, the, the you got to understand something. The priest cannot serve the Lord. Without the illumination, I am worthless. Without the illumination, I, I'm just a, I'm just up here giving a speech, and it wouldn't matter to you at all. It would be a performance. Okay, so. You also realize something. Look at verse 3. It says, and Aaron did so. He did what the Lord said. He lighted the lamps thereof over against the candlestick as the Lord commanded Moses. Now, if you look at a candlestick, how many lights are there on the candlestick? One. There's seven. There's seven lights on the candlestick. Seven lamps. Okay? And then there's one in the middle. Now, seven lamps, let me ask you, why would there be seven? I, I, I know there's a lot of, there's some of the reasons that are there, but there's a good reason. Another reason, they're all good reasons. How many dispensations are there? Seven. Now, does anybody here not know what dispensations are? Okay, I'm going to help you out. Dispensations, don't worry about not knowing. Dispensations are, did you ever have a Dixie cup? Dispenser, yeah. remember the old days? Yeah. What does it do? It dispenses Dixie cups. Yeah. Okay, dispensation. It's dispensing grace through times. Okay, Christ didn't die on the cross yet in the Old Testament. He's not going to be dispensing grace through that cross that never happened yet. So God has to find a way to dispense it, believing on his word. What about his word? what he's going to do in each, each one of these things he calls dispensations. You've got seven dispensations. You have when they're in the garden. That's one. When they're out of the garden by conscience, innocency, then they go into conscience. When they come out of the garden, they're living by, well, i got to figure out what's right and wrong. And of course, what happened? They figured out what was wrong before they figured out what was right all the time. That's man. Then after that, we go to Noah, and we have a government now that help you out as you go along and dispense his grace that way. And then, as time moves on, there's a guy coming up, and he, God calls him. His name is Abraham. And Abraham gets what? Promises. Believing on this promises. Do you realize that Abraham, none of them got them promises? But what they were doing, they were believing by faith that God was going to do it. See? God makes a, God makes a covenant with you, and then he does all the work. That's how you have to understand God. Okay, he does all the work. So, he's going to dispense grace by what? Believing what he said, his word, in what he said. And then after Abraham, then we know that the law came in, and when Moses comes in, and that's where we're at right now. Of course, after the law comes who? Comes Jesus Christ. And then, um, that's grace, the grace of God. And then the last one is, of course, the millennium. that's coming, the thousand-year reign of Christ. There's your seven. Very easy, very easy but through all that time, all those dispen all that dispensation, dispensation is about dispensing. It's not about an error of time, but it, it's in those areas. You have to understand so how God dispenses it. He has illumination through all that time. What's that? That light? The light of God. That light that's inside of you. When God came in on you, God came in and guess what? He gave you what we call illumination. Okay? Amen. You're born again. You have illumination. Verse number four. And this work of the candlestick was of beaten gold. It's been tried. It's been beaten just like you. 
unto the shaft thereof, unto the flowers thereof, was beaten work according to the, now look what it says, according to the pattern which the Lord showed Moses, so he made the candlestick. When did he show Moses that? When him and Joshua, remember, they went up on top? Yeah. He gave them the pattern of the tabernacle. And then Moses went aside. He, he showed Moses the uh, Genesis. After that, he went, took Moses back in the cleft of the rock and showed him Genesis, showed him the creation. How do you think he was able to write it? Whisper down the lane ain't going to work, people. Right. Amen. So <clears throat> he, uh, he says, so he made that uh, candlestick, okay? And um, let's, uh, let's look at uh, some of these because the Levites are now going to go from there. You got He's going to pick these guys called the Levites. And the Levites are going to be like his living lamps. They're going to be God's living lamps. Uh, let me ask you something. Who do you picture in the Old Testament? You picture the Levites. God said, I got you guys. And what's that? Once you got saved, you're a holy what? Priesthood. He said in Hebrews, you guys are a holy priesthood. What's that? You got saved. You're my kids. He picked the Levites out to spread the word, to spread it around the world. That's what it was for, to use the Levites. Now guess who he uses? He uses the church. It says in Revelation chapter 22, thus the, the, the spirit and the bride say, no. Well, who's the bride? Well, that's you. That's the church. Amen. And we know God's the spirit. So God, the spirit is in us. And what happens? We tell the others. We're the ones telling them. Come on. Right. Come. Come into the boat. As Noah would have said. Come into the boat. <laughs> Where it is. Amen. We're the ones that say come. So they're like, they are the, the living, the Levites are the uh, living lamps. They're us. Uh, go to uh, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And look at verse number 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 12. He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Now watch what he says. Work out your own salvation. Now, did that say work for your salvation? No. no, it says work out. See, people get messed up. It said work out your salvation. What's that mean? It's already in you. You're working out something that you already have. Uh, 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 we have people here with trades. There's something you're pretty good at. You've done something you're pretty good at. It's kind of like it's in you, and you got to work it out. Okay? It's no different than soon the cream raises the crop. It's just some people are really good at piano or really good at the trumpet or whatever. It just comes out. What's that? It's a gift. It's something they got. Everybody here has got something they're good at. And it shows forth in you. It comes out. What's that? You work it out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out what's already in you is what he's saying. Now look at verse 13. He says, For it is God which worketh where? In you. Both to will and to do his good pleasure. Okay? Uh, go to uh, verse number 15. It says that ye may be blameless and harmless. What's the next one? The sons of God. Look, you got the children of God. When you got saved, you're children of God. Right? Amen. When you start to serve God and you do something, then what are you? You're the sons of God. Amen. See how this is coming pretty quick? Uh, just so you know, if you went down to the church, you wouldn't even know what you're talking about. Right. You're way above them. You're way ahead of them now. Amen. Now when you read in Romans, when it says the manifestation of the sons of God, you'll know right now it's the appearing of the sons of God. What's that at the rapture? Everybody's a son of God at the rapture. But right now, you're not a son of God unless you, were gonna, you want to serve or do something. You want to be the remnant. Okay? 95% of Christianity ain't Christian. Amen. Hoorah. 
So that's what Philippians is saying. You're like the living lamb. Uh, go to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verse number, look at 35. He says, Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. That's Jesus. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whether he, where he goes. Verse 36. While ye have the light, while ye have the light, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus in the part and did hide himself from them. He says, while you're here, you're the children of light. Act like it. Act like the children of light. Go to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Page 1242. I'm only kidding. <laughs> My wife has the same for herself. <laughs> As I do. Amen. Matthew chapter 5. And go down to verse number 14. This is Jesus talking. I've read letters right there, isn't it? Yvonne, what does it say? Ye are what? Light. You got it. He says, ye are the light of the world. Who's that? You guys. Well, you, you're reflecting Christ's light. You're the, this is what he said about the Levites. They're like living lights and living lamps. He says, guess what? You're the picture of that now. What's that? You're my living lamps, he said. Ye are the light of the world. Okay? You guys. You're the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. And just so you know, the church can't be hid. If you ain't figured it out yet, just go on the news. And they'll tell you, make sure you know, the church can't be hid. What's that? Well, we're going to close churches. You can protest. You can kill people. You can do all these things. Bash somebody's head in. But guess what? Can't go to church. Right. Why? Well, I guess they teach morals there and, and uh, manners. So guess what? We won't want you there. We want you to rob people on the streets. Amen. But that's what it's like. So now, he did the light. He told you who you were. Now you know what he's going to do? He's going to give you some instruction. If this is how God works. He tells you, look, you're saved now, right? You're saved now. Now i got some instructions for you. It's life. That's why you're supposed to go to church. Why? Because Christ is in the church. He's working at the church. You think he's, he's not working in the field out there. He's not working in the house and all that stuff. Yeah, you can have, you're, you're, you're with him and stuff like that. If you continue on, he says. But wait. People, people, let me tell you something. You need church. Yeah. You need it. It's not, look, it's, it's, it's a need. It's not a want. It has to be a need. God says not forsaking the assembly. And you keep thinking like you're at home. Oh, I'm not forsaking. I saw it last month. No, he's acting like Christ is in the church, and then he's telling you not forsaking. What's that? Don't forsake. What's there? It's a lot of difference when you look at God's opinion and you look at your opinion. It's not your opinion. It's supposed to be his opinion. When I talked to Tabernacle, we didn't teach it from your perspective. Who did we teach it from? God's perspective. Like he's in the tabernacle, we're walking out. Amen. That's the better way to teach. At God's perspective. Why? He's the author of the book. Right. Amen. Now let's look at uh, chapter 5 and we'll go on. This, is, uh, this goes all the way down. I think this goes down to 22. So... Uh, he says, And he spake unto Moses, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel, and do what with them? And cleanse them. And cleanse these Levites. Uh, you know why? They're going to serve. You know what you need to go serve? You need to be cleaned up. You need to clean up to serve. Why is that? Well, he gave, he gave you guidelines. They're not, they're not like, uh, it's, it's, you need guidelines to serve. You need them. You know why you need to clean up? Because you're going to stick out. People are going to see you. 
People need to respect you. Uh, uh, you know, you. How would you? How would it be if a preacher? You had a preacher, and and, uh, and he had like all these civil judgments against him. And you know, or people were calling him a, a con artist or something like that. Hey, you you got to understand how would that fit with it? It wouldn't fit with the job. Uh, you know, uh, he's not a good guy. He's got a bad reputation. I'm not so worried about the reputation part as his character. Because anybody can say anything about anybody. And just so you know, you better be watching because within the next few years, watch your, rep watch your reputation. Keep your character because it's coming. There will be a falling away first. I just showed my wife this. The Bible says there's going to be a falling away first, right? Before it comes down. Just so you know, people, I want you to understand this. Your problem is you think that's a falling away of your country. You think that's a falling away of Christianity. It's not. The falling away is God's people and the remnant. They're the ones going to fall away. The mega churches and all the churches out here that play the rock and roll and everything else, don't expect them not to be still have people. It's going to dwindle in here. How do I know that? Because you're going to get the word. There's going to be a famine in the land, it said in the Bible. What is it, Amos 14? Or Zechariah 14? Or I forget where it is, Zechariah. He says there's a famine in the land. It's not a famine of meat or bread, but of hearing the word of God. Not the word of God, hearing it. That means you're not going to be hearing it. You better worry about that. Amen. That's what's going to happen. So he says, now watch, we're going to go in. He says, uh, take the Levites from among the children of Israel. And do what? Clean them up. You've got to be clean enough to serve. Clean it up. He says, and thus shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. Here's how you're going to clean them up. Sprinkle water of purifying upon them. And let them shave all their flesh. And let them wash their clothes. And, and, and so make themselves clean. You need to clean up. What has that? You need to shave your flesh. Go to, uh, well, we won't even need to go to, I'll give you the verse. It's Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says the word of God is quick and powerful, uh, and quick and powerful than any two-edged sword, right? And it says uh, cutting and dividing of the uh, soul and the spirit of the soul from the bones of the marrow, okay? That's the word of God's going to clean you up. And he's saying, man, you need to clean up you need to shave your fat flesh and all that. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about getting rid of some of that dead skin that's on you. Some of that dead flesh that's on you. See, that we, I'm not talking physically. I'm talking spiritually. you got a lot of old man in you. You, 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 there's, you get saved. When, where's the change? Where's the change? Okay, get rid of that old man that's, that you've been carrying around on you. You remember the old man, the one that loves to lie? You remember him. You remember the old man likes to... Likes to go to the rock concerts. You remember the old man. He says, what, get rid of that guy, cut him off. Start cutting that flesh away. Why? You need less flesh. You need to be less. Now think about it. When he's talking flesh, he's going to use the word in the New Testament. In print, he's going to use the word carnal. Meat, carnal, flesh. He's saying, what, you don't need to be carnal. So you've got to cut some of that away. Cut some of that flesh away. you got to clean up. you got to clean up. Uh, you remember a passage in John chapter 13 when Jesus comes in and he washes their feet? And he says, man, he turns around, he's washing. They say, Peter turns around, he says, you can wash their feet, not mine, Lord. And the Lord says, well, if I ain't washing your feet, Peter, you can't have a part of me. And Peter turns around and says, okay, Lord, not just my feet, my head. Everything clean me up. Okay? And he says, don't worry, I don't need to. I just need where you've walked to. Now, he's not talking about actually cleaning their feet, obviously. What is he talking about there? He says, you're walking around in the world, and what happens is you get dirty. Yeah. They've got bad mouths out there. They've got <clears throat> toilet mouths, and what happens is you hear that stuff, and you pick it up. I've been saved 20-something years, and let me tell you something. Every once in a while when I get mad, cuss words come into my head. I don't know about you, but they do. Why? Is that for 22 years? Why? There's a lot of old man left in me. Yep. And I get dirty because of that world. Now, can sometimes you stay in that world too long, you know what you'll do? You'll act like it. You'll act like it. So, Jesus said, you've got to get cleaned up. Go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. 
What, what do you mean? I got you gotta clean up. It's near the book of Revelation, all the way in the back. First John chapter one. Now let's look go down to verse number seven. It says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Oh, you want fellowship with each other? We better have Jesus. We better have fellowship with Jesus. He just said that. Now watch. He says. We have fellowship with one another, and what does he say? And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from how much sin? Oh. All sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. We have a sin nature, and it's not going to be done <coughs> until, the, until the manifestation of the sons of God wins at the rapture. You've got this sin nature in you, and it's going to continue until God changes it. Amen. Now look at verse number nine. What's the what? What do we have to do to, to clean up? If we do what? Confess, our Confess sin. what? Our sin. our sin, not faults, nothing. Why? Faults are things that we tell each we can tell each other. Look, I got a pride issue. I'm a know-it-all. I got these things like they they hamper me. Okay, you know them now, so you can deal with that. That's what we do. I know your faults, therefore I can deal with that. All right. But he says, this is sins now. If we confess our sins, we confess them to God, not to man. He is faithful and just to do what? Forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay? How do you get cleansed? Confess your sins. You know what? You've got to clean up if you want to serve. That's what, don't worry, I do that all the time. I'm going to call your name on this. <laughs> Amen. Go to uh, look down at um, verse number uh, 8. He says, Then let them take a young bullock with the meat offering, with fine flour mingled with oil, and another young bullock shalt thou take for a sin offering. See how it falls right in line spiritually? You got something here. What if we confess our sins? And thou shalt bring the Levites before the tabernacle of the congregation and thou shalt gather the whole assembly of the children of Israel together and thou shalt bring the Levites before the Lord and the children of Israel shall put their hands upon the Levites and Aaron and Aaron shall offer the Levites before the Lord for an offering of the children of Israel that they may execute the service of the Lord. You want to execute the service of the Lord? Okay, well, you know why he's putting his hands on them? It is, there's no magic. There's no magic, okay? Nothing, nothing physical is going to do anything spiritual like that. People who think that water is going to change them or that laying of hands or speaking in the weird language, weird things, they don't change anything. Okay, that's all silly stuff that you need to get mature about. Amen. They need to be mature people, not crazy people. What is the laying on of hands? I'm going to show you what the laying hand on of hands is. Go to Romans chapter 12. We're talking about service of the Levites here, right? Service. You want to work for God. That's a different thing, man. We're not talking about just getting saved now. We're talking about you're going to go out there and actually serve the Lord. Do something. And guess what? Every one of you can. Verse number one, right in the beginning. He says, I beseech you, brethren, uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice, holy, 
acceptable unto God. <clears throat> now watch this. Which is your what? Reasonable, reasonable service. service. You know, that's kind of like minimum, isn't it? Amen. See how that? It's tough to serve God. Amen. It's a high standard, a high calling, a living sacrifice. Hey, look. Anybody can die for something. I hear it all the time. Guys, I'll die for my wife. I'll die for my country. I'll die for that. Why don't you live for it? Right. The living sacrifice. If you put, if it's putting your hand. It's, look, there's nothing magic. We're just putting our hands on somebody, a preacher, praying for them. And what we're doing is we're offering him up a living sacrifice. He goes to another place. He preaches the gospel. And guess what he could do doing it? Just like living sin and all the others. They could be boiled in, boiled in oil. Their heads could be chopped off or whatever. What's that? They're a living sacrifice. They're going over and they're going to preach the gospel even if they have to die. Amen. 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 So that's what you're talking about with a why they're putting their hands on a living sacrifice. Okay? And, uh, and that's what, look what it says in verse 11. And Aaron shall offer... The Levites, just like Jesus. Jesus is offering up his children, what? For an offering of the children of Israel, of his children, that they may execute the service of the Lord. Verse 12, and the Levites shall lay their hands upon the heads of the bullocks. And thou shalt offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering unto the Lord to make what? An atonement, an atonement for who? The Levites. We didn't see that in the other books, just so you know. You're making atonement for the Levites. What's that? You're chosen for service. So guess what? you got to get covered by God and His righteousness. That's God's righteousness right there. The atonement for the Levites. Okay, verse number 13. And thou shalt set the Levites before Aaron and before his sons, and offer them for an offering unto the Lord. Thus shalt thou separate the Levites... From among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall be whose? That's what God just said. The Levites are mine. And after that shall the Levites go in to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and thou shalt cleanse them and offer them for an offering. An offering. Look, when you're looking at Israel, you have to realize something, even all together, this is the same as Christianity. Paul said it. He said, not all Israel is what? Israel. Right. And how can that be? They have the name Israel. They're not believers. They're not, they're not Israel unless they're, unless they're Israel. They're just Israel in the flesh. They were born uh, Israel. Okay? They come out of that seed. But guess what? There's a spiritual thing about it. If you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and who God sent as the Messiah, you're not real Israel. And you're not because you weren't born there, but you're a Christian. Amen. Okay, you got saved. There's only three three types of people. That's a Gentile, the Jew, and the church. Right. If you got saved, you're just a church. If, it is, if, if a Jew today gets saved, guess what he is? He's a church. Gentile gets saved, he's a church. Amen. Amen. Really, there's only two, the lost and the saved. Amen. Right. So, he, he, he says, uh, and just like that with Israel... Just so you know, not all Christians are Christians. Right. Amen. I, I can go down the street right now. I can walk up and down and ask people, and I did it a lot of times. Are you a Christian? Yes, I am. I go over there to this, to that, to that St. James or whatever it is. Oh, really? Are you born again? No, somebody lying to you. You're not a Christian. You ain't born again. That Bible says. He must be born again. You notice how he's only talking to Nicodemus, but he puts a ye. God knew exactly what he said. Amen. He knows what he's saying. Um, you need to be born again. Not all Christians. Just so you know, the, the Pope never says he's a Christian. You gotta listen to him. He says, I'm he tells you, he says, I am a Roman, I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic. I am the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. We are the leaders of Christianity. We have an outsider leading Christendom. The reason why is 95% of Christendom is in Christian. They're not saved. They got the wrong salvation. They just call themselves that. They're not saved. Saved is that you got, you went to Christ, you put your trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and this blood atonement. Amen. 
So they're not all saved. Go to, let's keep going. Verse number 16. For they are wholly given unto me from among the children of Israel instead of such as open every womb even instead of the firstborn of the children of Israel have I taken them unto me. For all the firstborn of the children of Israel are mine, are mine, both man and beast. On the day that I smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. And I have taken the Levites for the firstborn of the children of Israel. Okay. The original plan was to take the firstborn of Israel. Reuben. Do you remember that guy, Reuben? The young oldest boy, what did he do? He slept with his father's wife. So what happened? He lost his inheritance. Joseph got the double inheritance. That's why he has two boys that are tribes now. Ephraim and Manasseh. He got a double portion. That was supposed to be Reuben's. Okay, now this is what's going on. Okay? God has a plan. His plan was that he was going to use the firstborn there. Well, guess what? Something happened. Now he's using who? The Levites. Why? Exodus 32. What's that? Moses said, who's on the Lord's side? Remember that? Yeah. Not all Israel ran over. Judah didn't run over. Who ran over? The Levites. They're the ones. He picked the Levites now. Okay? Just so you know, he could have had all... There's Israel out there, but guess who he's using today? He's using the church. He's using the church people. you got to realize that. What's that? Well, they're the ones that are chosen. Yeah. The church. We're the chosen vessel. Men are chosen. Why? He says in the Bible, he says, many are called, but few are chosen. Okay? you got to understand how this is done. It's not that God turns around and goes, I chose you before, and that's it. you got to have the right credentials. What are the right credentials when you got to call upon the Lord? Well, that guy has the right. Well, there he is. He says, Lord, remember me. Right, amen. He's got the right heart. I choose him. That's how you got saved. <laughs> you get it? Amen. It's that easy, people. It's that easy. It's This is not complicated. We make it, You know who makes it complicated? Guys who want to get authority over you. They want to be your, your king. Kingdom builders. Most of, just so you know, most of Christianity is a bunch of kingdom builders. That's what they are. Amen. All right, let's go on. Verse number 19. And I have given the Levites as a gift to who? Yeah. Isn't that something? I'm going to take all those people just give them the gift to you. Do what you want with them. They're a gift. Amen. And to his sons from among the children of Israel. What for? To do the service of the children of Israel in the tabernacle of the congregation and to make an atonement for the children of Israel. Do you realize what's happening here? This is a miracle. But you looked past it. You didn't see it. The greatest miracle isn't Jesus going around healing the blind. It isn't Jesus going around and talking to some guy that you can hear now. They're, they're not the great miracles. They're Benny Hinn. They will turn around and make that. You, they're the great miracles. You know, you know what the greatest miracle is? The new birth. The new birth, how God can go inside of you and be in you. All of him is in you. Unbelievable. But here's the greater one. And he said, you'll do greater, greater miracles than I did. And God said, you know what the greatest miracle is? I can take this broken vessel like me. Here he is, this guy up here. In God's eyes, if I just stay, I'm a loser. I'm, a, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm, I'm a broken vessel. I don't. I deserve hell, right? I do. I deserve it. And you know what God says? I'm gonna have this guy talk to you. He might change your life. He might change your eternity. A broken vessel can lead somebody to Christ. 
A broken vessel can actually preach a message. I'm going to have this guy preach a message that he can't live. And he's going to get, I'm going to get you to believe it. Because I told you it. And it's in my book. You don't think that? That's the great miracle, the birth. The new birth is the greatest miracle. And you'll do greater miracles than these, Christ said. Hey, let me ask you something. Could not have Jesus come down, spent three years and wrote the whole book? The whole New Testament could have wrote it. Turned around and went, here you go, follow it, and walked away. Could have done it. How many words did Jesus write that are in that Bible? I understand that, but physically with his hands. Four times. None. None. He never took a piece of paper out. He never wrote on it. He used men. And he had to communicate his message to men. And they had to write it down. And it had to be perfect. And they didn't even know they were doing it. Paul's writing a letter. And he gets done. And, it, and, it, and he wrote to these people. And it's incredible. And he used that book. He's using a broken vessel to, to give you a perfect message. <laughs> That's incredible. Only Jesus could do that. And he's allowed men to do it. It's an incredible thing. I, I just think it's real big. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but he talks about, he's talking about this, an atonement, making an atonement for Israel to do that service. And he says, uh, for you guys, you gotta, once you got saved, you have the atonement. And he, what he's trying to say to the Levites is, now that you've got the atonement, I want you to continue in it. I redeem the time. Take hold of your eternal life and do something with it, is what he's saying. I want you to serve me, okay? Uh, look, the blood has been shed, and now you have the peace of God. Do something with it. Do something with it. I'll tell you what, man. Here's what I'll give you what. You got, you, there's somebody out there you know. It's not safe. You know Do something with that. Change their history. Change their history. Make it a point. Verse number, uh, verse number 20. And Moses and Aaron, and Moses and Aaron, all the congregation of the children of Israel did to the Levites according unto all that the Lord commanded Moses concerning the Levites. So did the children of Israel unto them. And the Levites were purified. And they washed their clothes, and Aaron offered them as an offering before the Lord. And Aaron made an atonement for them to cleanse them. And after that went the Levites in to do their service in the tabernacle of the congregation before Aaron and before his sons. As the Lord had commanded Moses concerning the Levites, so did they unto them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, This is it that belongeth unto the Levites. From twenty and five years old and upward, they shall go in and wait upon the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Okay, he says, guess what? This is what's going to happen. You guys are going to do this. Um, there was no works to get in. None of them did any work to get in. But let me tell you something. But once you're ch chosen, what are you chosen to do? Good works. You're, gonna, you're here to do good works, he says, Levi. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of a, a. You want a good piece of meat to go home with? Later on, there's this guy shows up just before Jesus Christ, and he's a messenger, and his name is John. Okay, and John shows up. Now, what tribe is John from? Levi. He's a Levite. Okay, he's a Levi. Uh, his fa uh, John's father, Zacharias. Now remember, he's still related to Mary, so he's also his wife, John's, uh, John's father, Zacharias' wife. She was from the tribe of Judah. But anyway, he's a Levite. He's working in the temple, if you remember. He's the one that does the uh, censor and the prayers. Okay? So he's a Kohathite. So John, being his son, is a what? Kohathite. He works in, he was, he was bound to work inside. Now, what is John doing out there? He's baptizing people. He's putting them under the water. And he's saying what? He says, repent, and, and for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
he says. Repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come on down here. I gotta ask you a question. If they were killing everybody else for heresy, why didn't they kill John? <clears throat> Good question, isn't it? That's an incredible question. Why didn't they kill John? He's preaching something new that we thought. Yes, what if I told you he's not really not? What is John doing? Well, John, what John's doing is says we're getting ready for the Messiah. Go to Exodus 19. Exodus 19. This is before the Levites came. This is when they just left and they came out. And he says something to them in 19. He's, he's telling them, he says, look, if you obey my voice and keep, keep my commandments, you know, this thing, then this thing will happen and all that. But watch what he says about them. He says, look, at, we're going to start in verse number 5. Now, therefore, if ye, if, that's conditional, you don't have to do it. But if ye will obey my voice, indeed, that means hearken, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Number, uh, chapter 6, I mean verse 6. And ye shall, this is all of Israel, ye shall be unto me a what? A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shall speak unto the children of Israel. He says, look, they're gonna, I want the whole Israel to be a kingdom of priests. That's what John's doing. Amen. Separate yourself from the religious people over here. The Messiah has come. Get ready for the Messiah. He's going to be coming down the way, and he did. And John baptized. He, held, he said, there he is. Get over here and get right and separate yourself. You believe now. Get baptized. And guess what? You're a priest now. You're like the priest. You're separated. From what? Those other guys. Go to Acts chapter 2. You like this piece of meat? Good one, isn't it? Acts chapter 2. This is another verse everybody's going to get messed up. Gets messed up on. Acts chapter 2. Peter starts preaching. Look at verse 22. Ye men of who? Israel. Who's he talking to? Israel. Israel, Jews. Ye men, Peter's preaching to them at Pentecost. He says, ye men of Israel, hear these what? Words. Hear me. And he gives the thing of Jesus of Nazareth. Talks about what it, everything he done. Okay? Now, look at verse, go to verse number um, 36. Therefore, let all the house of who? Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, what? That Jesus is the Christ and the Messiah. They were pricked in their heart. They came to God right there. That's where they were. Now watch what it says. And said unto Peter to the re and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's not a salvation call. Salvation, you don't do anything. He says, what do we do? We know he's the Christ now. What are we going to do? They're already saved people. Now what do we do? Now watch what he says. He says, repent and be baptized. They're already saved. Now what? It, repent and be baptized. For what? The remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What's the gift? The filling of the Holy Ghost. Not being saved from the Holy Ghost. That's the sealing. The filling is when He comes upon you. What for? You're going to be like priests now. You're going to be, you're going to be, I want you to get out there and preach the word. I want you to get this done. Why? Watch what He says. This is what He says. Let's continue on. 
Verse number 39, for the promise is unto you, Israel, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. I mean, he's going to disperse them out, even other people. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from hell? No, from this untoward generation. See them guys over there, they don't believe like that all Israel isn't Israel. That Those people don't believe. You've got to separate yourselves from them. Why? I'm going to use you. Do you see Numbers 8? Amen. It's you. Call to the service, man. Call to the service. Amen. Go back to uh, Numbers chapter 8. I'll stop sweating in a second. Amen. <clears throat> now he said to him, he said, back in there, he said, this belongeth to the Le unto the Levites, verse 24. Unto the Levites from 25 years old and upward. From 25 years old and upward. Why 25? We heard it was 30. Now all of a sudden it's 25. We're mistaken about them. No. You start at 25. What's 25 for? You need five years experience. You're an apprentice. Hey, look, I'm going to grab a 20-year-old kid and stick him up here and say, all right, Pastor, start preaching. All right, you do it. He's got no experience, no life experience. He needs to have experience in the service. Amen. He says there's a five-year apprenticeship here, okay, uh, to see if he's okay. What's another thing you're going to see? Man, what if the guy's got a mental issue? What if he's got some mental issues or something like that? You know what he's going to be preaching? Stop. Amen. Keep going. Look at, let's go to verse 25. He says, And from the age of 50, they shall cease waiting upon the service thereof and shall serve no more. Why? Because after 50, let's face it, there's problems. We see it happening right with us, right with us today. People are, you, you get, you know, let's face it, people get, how many people here lose their keys regularly? Amen. How many people forget everything? <laughs> Why? We're well, getting older. Right. You're getting older, and life's after 50 years old. He's saying, "Look, life's a little different now. You're forgetting things. I need you to be a little sharper. It's time to go out. It's time to retire. Let the old, let the younger guys take care of it." But you know what usually happens? The younger guys don't take care of it, and then you got Eli sitting there, and he's he's much older in Samuel. And, and, his, and his eyes are dim, and the light goes out of the tabernacle because he can't keep up with it because guess what? He's going to forget to light it. That's what happens when you get older. Things happen, you mess things up. It's just the way of the earth. We get old, and we go, we go away. God wants sharp people. He gives them 20 years of service. Isn't it odd that the military service is like 20 years? Cop service is like 20 years? And now this? They know what God knows exactly what he's doing. We go by his guidelines it's pretty good. That's why he tells you, he says, look, you're supposed to take care of your parents when they're old. Why? Well, now you've got the ability to do it. Take care of your parents. Amen. You have to understand something about this. It says, we'll go to that last verse. I'm going to put, put, put a charge to you. He says, but, verse 26, but shall, uh, he says, uh, they shall serve no more, but shall minister with their brethren in the tabernacle of the congregation to keep the charge and and shall do no service. They, they're, the, they're the advice you want. Thus shalt thou uh, do unto the Levites touching uh, their charge. He, he's talking about separation. He's talking about you want to do service? I've got some service for you to do. But guess what? For you guys today, you better want to do it. It's not a, it's not a, look, I can't, I, I can't tell you even to come to church. I can't, can't command you. I can't. I just tell you to come. I can't command you. It's got to be voluntary. Why? It's got to be your love for God. Amen. He doesn't get any love unless it's voluntary. I want you to be by free will. Hey, man, I want to learn about this God. I want to learn more and more and more. You know why I want to learn more and more and more? Because one day I want to stand before him. And if you know somebody real well, you'll know how to stand before him. I tell you this, don't stand before him. If you're real smart, get in there low. <laughs> Nobody walk into the judgment seat of Christ. You're going in. You're going in. After the rapture, every one of us is going in. It's going to be private. Do not go in walking. Go in on your belly. 
Don't worry, you'll be 33 years old about something like that. You'll be able to. Everything will be working great. Get on your belly and go in and crawl. And everything he says, you have three answers. Yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. That's it. Do not say anything else. Yes, sir. No. Did, were you dead by the Baptist church yesterday? Did you do everything you should have done? No. What's your, what's your issue? No excuse. Where'd you learn that in the service? When somebody came in my office, they had three answers. Yeah, yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. I take that. That's a good guy. Amen. I'm sorry, Lord. Look, here's about service. We have to understand about service for the Lord. No service is honorary. We're not like uh, everybody wants an honorary doctor degree. I have a doctor of divinity. I'm a doctor of this. I'm a God. God's not sick. He doesn't need any doctors. Okay? We don't need any. We, we don't. That doesn't do anything. I got a PhD. So what? God spoke to me last week. He taught me the book of. He showed me in Numbers chapter eight what I'm what I'm supposed to do. That's better. Wouldn't you rather talk to God and get a degree? Amen. So talk to God. Don't go get a. You don't need a degree to talk to God. Amen. No service is honorary. Okay? Guess what else? It's for us. No service is hereditary. You're not born a Christian. You're not born into the service. That's the problem with most preachers. They have sons and their sons think they should take over. And you know what usually happens? Preacher's kids are usually the worst kids in the, in the church. And that's your next preacher. Oh boy, I feel sorry for what's coming out of his mouth and going into your ears. Right. Amen. Amen. I see preachers all the time send their kids to Bible school, Bible school, forcing them into the ministry, and what you're getting is a pig with perfume. Amen. Let them do exactly what everybody... That's not hereditary. You love the Lord or you don't love the Lord. You'll serve because you love Him. And that's the only reason. Not because their daddy was a preacher. Amen. Amen. And I know a lot of guys whose daddies were preacher, And they're good preachers. And they serve the Lord real well. But not all. And it's not hereditary. You know what else it's not? It's not mandatory. Nobody here is forced to do it. You better do it. If you want to do it, you want to do it because you love the Lord. And that's the only reason you're going to do it. If you don't love him, don't do it. If you don't want to do it, don't want, don't do it. Why? There's another guy. You're so worried. You know what? You've been taught this and it's wrong. I'll tell you exactly what's wrong about it. I've heard preachers say it, that if you don't speak to somebody and you don't tell them, their blood is on your hands. Show me the Bible verse. And I can guarantee I know in Ezekiel where you're going to go. And that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. You don't want to preach to somebody. You don't want to tell somebody. God will get somebody else to do it. Because nobody's going to stand in front of the Lord. No one. Now, if you have a responsibility and you feel for the, for somebody, go talk to them. But I can't make you. I can't make you tell them. But you have to understand something. God, Nobody's going to stand before the Lord and say, I never heard them. Oh, what about these people in deep darkness? They're not good. I just told you. Nobody's going to stand before God and say, I never heard them. Everybody heard them. That's the way it is. What about these people in dark, deep darkest Africa? Has God given you a calling? Get over there if you're so worried. It's like every time your parents say, you know, there's people starving in India. I actually said to my mom, you got an envelope? I'll put the stuff in there. <laughs> Amen. Just so you know, it's got to be it's got to be by the love of your heart to do something. It's good that way. And guess what? It'll be an acceptable sacrifice if it's given in love rather than mandatory. God doesn't need robots. He needs people that love Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord God. Good chapter, Father. Good chapter for us, Lord God. Let us act like Levites. Let us cleanse ourselves. Now let us clean ourselves up, Lord Father, for Thee. We thank you, Lord, for doing all kinds of things for us, man. Everything above salvation is just a good blessing and benefit. Thank you for the prayers tonight, Lord. And thank you for others praying. Thank you for those that are praying for us, Lord Father. And thank you, Lord, for being good to us. Father, we ask you, if you would, bless our time here. Bless Mary, Lord. She needs it right now. She needs that, she needs that 
that, that comfort you can give her, Lord Father, and I just pray she have it. Uh, I pray, Lord God, that you take whatever it is out of, her, out of the way, Lord Father. We're looking for a healing and a cure, Lord God. Lord God, you, you got our attention. Get us on our knees and we pray. Thank you, Lord Father, that you would uh, come and give pity and mercy, Lord Father. We thank you. Thank you for all you do for us again, Lord God. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.